Grace and peace to you from God who is and who was and who is to come. I welcome you to First Mennonites worship service. Today we begin a six-week Lenten series that calls us to identify what is essential, what really matters, who we are at the core, and what God asks and doesn't ask of us. Lent is a call for deep self-examination in order to rediscover God's words, you are my beloved. It is my hope and my prayer that God's spirit may direct us, inspire us, and comfort us as we worship together. Psalm 25 encourages an openness to acknowledge shortcomings and also an openness to learn about God's ways. The psalmist writes, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed whom are wantingly treacherous. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O God. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Let us pray. Holy God, Your goodness always tests our readiness to receive us. Please increase our eagerness for you and enlarge our ability to share your love around. On this Sunday in Lent, we recognize your love for us and approach you with an openness for self-examination. On this Sunday of Lent, we think of those who are being actually tempted, tempted to look the other way, when wrong is happening in their workplace, tempted to misuse their gifts as a sordid purpose, tempted to allow untamed emotions to hold sway, tempted by the corrupting power of money, and those tempted to stay in a rut rather than to strike out on new paths for Christ's sake. Generous God, guide us through times of temptation and deliver us from evil. We pray also for the many who feel pushed and tested almost beyond their endurance. Those in positions of heavy responsibility who feel overloaded to the point of collapse. Or those pressured from all sides of factions in workplace or community. Suffering people and all who must watch a loved one suffer. Who feel they can bear no more. Kindly folk whose patience with a difficult friend is now at breaking point. Persecuted Christians whose faith seems stretched beyond their limit. And the depressed whose inner being endures a misery which no human word can alleviate. We pray for those who seem to be in position of advantage. We pray for the happy, that their happiness may always be used for goodwill and compassion the strong, that their energies may be used wisely and gently, the clever, that they may employ their mental facility for good, not evil, for the rich, that their wealth may be shared for the uplifting of the poor, for the powerful, that they may use their position as a blessing to humanity, and those of strong faith, that they may walk humbly and affirm the weaker souls. Righteous God, direct us through times of temptation and deliver us from evil. Comforting God, we pray for each other in this church 
and all those who listen to our service from distant places. None of us know the extent of the pressures that some may be under this very day. Look upon us all, read our thoughts and weigh our feelings, and by your utter resourceful guide us and fill us anew. We offer ourselves to you by praying together the prayer your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Advent and I showed this Advent candle holder that we use. 
Each Sunday, we light one candle as we prepare for Christmas. Now, today is the first Sunday of, does anybody know? Lent. How many of you are familiar with that word? Well, Lent prepares us for Easter. Lent is when we walk with Jesus for 40 days all the way to the cross and then Easter. Now, to help us prepare for this, last weekend, some of the Sunday School families received a delivery of pancake mix, beeswax to make candles, and a devotional. This is a reminder to us that we are still in the time of celebration. But why pancake mix? Well, on February 16th, we started with Shrove Tuesday. This marks the change of seasons as the day before Ash Wednesday and then the beginning of Lent. So what is Shrove Tuesday? Well, this tradition encouraged the using up of rich foods of eggs, butter, cream, before turning to the simple fasting meals of Lent. So we eat pancakes. How many of you celebrated with pancakes or made candles for the journey of Lent? If you did and you took a picture, please send it to Erica so she can make a collage and then we can all view it and share it. Now Carl and I had pancakes and we created a centerpiece of seven candles. During Lent, we start with seven candles and light one less candle each week. So today, we have all the candles lit. You may also want to create a centerpiece of candles and light your candles as you eat together or enjoy another activity that your household does. Now during Lent, we make space for God to lift us up, a time to focus on the life and work of Jesus. Now some people, they cook weekly Lenten meals, or they choose a project, like cleaning out their rooms, read all the Gospels in the Bible, or they give up something for Lent. Now, giving up something represents Jesus' sacrifice when he went to the desert to pray and fast for 40 days and nights before later dying on the cross. Now, it doesn't have to be something bad, but maybe something you might miss. I gave up my hair. <laughs> yes, he gave up his hair. Now, some years... I have given up french fries or chocolate. This year, I have chosen to give up potato chips. Next time I lead the children's feature, I'll let you know how that went. So each week, we will light one less candle and continue to prepare for Easter. I hope you will be able to find some ways that you too can prepare for Easter during this Lenten season. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for our church community and be with us during these weeks of Lent as we find ways to prepare for Easter. Open our eyes to see Jesus in our world today and help us to be, to be present to others in need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a great week. Take care. Let us pray and give thanks for everything we have received. God of the wilderness, we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. 
and with these offerings we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts and with open hands. Amen. Genesis 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall the flood destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. And I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh on the earth. I will be reading from Mark 1 verses 9 to 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, 
proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The season of Lent begins with the waters and the wilderness of life. All the texts chosen for this Sunday in this season allude in some way to these two images. We have the flood story, where the water destroys all previous life, save what is on the ark, which lands on what could only be called wilderness, as everything had been destroyed. One of the texts for this Sunday that was not read is from the strange imagery of 1 Peter chapter 3, where we read again about the waters of the flood, but these that have imprisoned lost souls in a sort of endless wilderness to whom Christ descended in death to proclaim his message of resurrection. And of course, we heard the most common image for Lent from Mark's gospel, in which Jesus emerges from the waters of baptism and is led for 40 days in the wilderness. Water and wilderness. God's people were born in water and wilderness. Freed from slavery, they pass through the waters of the Red Sea and learn a new way in the wilderness. Water and wilderness. A person can be born again in the waters of baptism, let out like a child, to learn faith and trust again in the wilderness. What we find in these images, though, is that if we want to gather and attend to our deepest and most profound hope, is that we must also be willing to attend to our deepest and most profound fears, wounds, 
and regrets. To be very clear, and I do want to be clear about this from the beginning, is this is not about writing a list of how bad a person we are. Somehow or other, over time, the church became fixated with personal moral failings. That is, it seemed the church went about its business in producing blame in, vid- in individuals so that it could then offer salvation. In fact, I still sometimes think we live in a secular version of that reality in which we are constantly shown and reminded of how we have failed and not lived up to whatever image of the good life we see around us. So again, to be clear, Lent is not about punishing ourselves, about convincing or reminding ourselves of how bad we are. I don't think individual moral failing is actually the best way to talk about sin. Rather, sin is that reality and force that gives ground to death, that punishes, that wounds, and binds our lives, the lives of others, and creation. So yes, sometimes our individual choices wound and harm ourselves or those around us. But the point of repentance and salvation is healing and life not believing that if we feel bad enough about ourselves, we will somehow please a God we have disappointed. That's probably more about our parents than God. So rather than dwelling in how bad we are in Lent, we simply allow the depth of our hope to call out to the depth of our sin. Because not everything we call hope has the capacity to travel to these places. Much of what passes for hope is often the avoidance and denial of things left undone or wounds that remain. And that can be okay for a time. We can't always dwell in these deep places. And so there are different seasons for what we are called to do. So what then could it mean to let the deep places of hope draw near to the deep places of sin? in the season of Lent. I think first we need to give ourselves permission and also find safety for this because it will probably mean facing our fears. Whenever a text for preaching alludes to the flood story, I can't help thinking of the biographical essay written by James Baldwin in which he attempts to reckon with his life as a gay black man both in the church and in America in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The title of the essay is The Fire Next Time, which alludes to an old spiritual which says, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. Basically meaning that if the church and America cannot reckon with its past and face its fears, then another form of judgment will come to it anyways. And so speaking of his own earlier life, Baldwin says he used to take pride in believing that he could outwit his fear, but goes on to realize that to defend oneself against a fear is simply to ensure that one will one day be conquered by it, for fears must be faced. I think this is the case for individuals and for cultures, societies, and churches. To face our fears is one way to come to the waters. The symbolic nature of water in the Bible is not primarily about being cleaned. The waters, rather, are the powers of chaos which bring both death and life. It was at the sight of the waters that creation was first brought forth. It was at the flood that we found the undoing and redoing of creation. It was through the waters of the Red Sea that Pharaoh was undone and the Hebrews passed through, born a people of God. It plays out in the story of Jonah where he is cast into the sea, experiencing his own death and rebirth. It is the waters that allow for an undoing that we might be remade. 
I'm not entirely sure always how to do this as a church or as an individual, but I think it's important to try and accept this process, not be coerced, but understand that it's necessary. The wisdom in accepting the work of undoing, because as Baldwin says, it will end up conquering us anyways if we don't. Here again, Baldwin offers some guidance when facing the difficulty of the past, saying, to accept one's past, one's history, is not the same thing as drowning in it. It is learning how to use it. For an invented past can never be used. It cracks and crumbles under the pressures of life like clay in a season of drought. Interestingly enough, Baldwin uses the imagery of drowning because that is what it can feel like when we face troubled waters of our past. But he also knows that if we try to live through only our ideals, our imaginations, our rose-colored glasses of the past, then it will eventually crumble under pressure. And so we face these things, and in facing hard realities, it can mean a type of suffering. But it's a suffering which has nothing to do with guilt or shame or self-hatred, but a suffering that comes in facing the wrongs done to us and the wrongs we have done. It is a loss, but a loss of the naive images we had about how things were. As a black person, Baldwin knew this suffering through the world's inability to accept him. But he says he needed to learn how to endure this suffering while holding to his humanity, snatching his humanity from the fires of cruelty, as he put it. For he says that to do this, to hold to your humanity and to suffer the loss of our ideals and naive notions of the past. To do this is to know something about yourself, to know something that the world cannot teach and that the world cannot take. This is our baptism imagery. Whether it helps us to be lifted from the shadows of shame or to be pulled down from pedestals or high horses, we are all called to wade into the water the waters of life that will undo us so that we might be reborn in something eternal. The waters are our image of transformation, not simply to be scrubbed clean to look respectable, but to pass through the struggle of another birth, to hear then as Jesus did at his own baptism, the words of God which says, this is my child whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. So it is to live increasingly in an eternal life, prevailing over what seeks to accuse and destroy in this life. This is why we can trust the undoing and the remaking of the waters and not fear what may feel like chaos for a time. But we also can't simply live in those moments. As Erica mentioned last week, we can't stay on the mountaintop and neither can we remain swimming in the waters. Rather, we go out to the wilderness like the Hebrews after the Red Sea and like Jesus after baptism. But why the wilderness? The wilderness is the place outside the powers of the world. A place both liberating and terrifying. It is a place of wild beasts and angels, as Mark's Gospel recounts. The place of plain daily bread and the dazzling burning bush. There is perhaps some romance for us in this image But for those who have had to live outside the powers of the world or been rejected by it, it can be a fierce and desperate space. 
Reflecting on this, I couldn't help think about the image of Jesus as being born in Winnipeg. Then in his late 20s, traveling up to where the Red River meets Lake Winnipeg to find a wild elder wrapped in moose hide, submersing the repentant polar bear style in the icy waters where the lake had not yet frozen. Jesus then called by the Spirit walking some 50 kilometers south down the 320 until Selkirk, walking further down the number nine into Main Street all the way downtown. I think about the 40 days in the wilderness and then I think about 40 days living on the street in a Winnipeg winter. A wilderness, if ever there was one. Some friends and I brought some supplies and volunteered at the emergency warming shelters set up at Maine and Higgins last weekend. I was reminded there of the alternative, that the alternative to the wilderness needed to be more than just a warm space. Two of the shelters there had comfortable fires inside, but one of them, even by midnight, was not close to full. There was, however, also a large outdoor fire with a loose metal structure around it that people piled mats and blankets around. For a variety of reasons, some people will not simply gather in a confined space with others they don't know. And so they remained outside under a clear sky as the temperature dropped to one of our last frigid minus 35 nights. The mood around the fire was mostly pleasant and calm, but talking with one of the organizers, he said that the challenge was that when they begin to fall asleep or pass out around the fire outside, you need to keep the fire large so that they would be okay overnight. Myself, I decided to bow out around 3 a.m., trusting that for the rest of the night, and of course, all the other nights, someone, some angel, would keep the fires going. But of course, we also know that there's not always a guardian angel, as we've lost two lives already to our winter wilderness. This, too, is the reality of wilderness. Now, I very explicitly used an extreme image of wilderness because wilderness is extreme. I didn't want to soften the image too quickly. It is, of course, not the only appropriate image of wilderness. But I do think if we are going to open ourselves to the deepest places of hope, then we must also understand the darkest places of wilderness which of course also includes the wilderness of loss, depression, addiction, prisons, all those places of beasts and angels. But we open ourselves up because we have faced our fears, passed through the waters, being confirmed in God's love, we are given strength and vision to increasingly move into places of wilderness not to suffer, but to learn trust, mutual care, common humanity outside the forces that can so quickly bind and isolate us from love and justice. So let your deepest hope call out and find our deepest hurts. Let the water do its work and learn to trust in the wilderness. And then also lift your head, accept and receive whatever blessings may come. If you are offered a drink in the wilderness, rest and enjoy it. If you find the waters of change become playful and exciting, have fun with them. The point is that these practices are for healing and not for harm. These deep places don't need to be heavy places but rather places of deep faith and trust, places of deep joy and peace, deep currents of life, even or maybe especially in the wilderness. 
So this Lent, have faith. Let the water work and share what you have in the wilderness. There is enough, more than enough. May God bless us and lead us in this season. Amen. Beginning with this Sunday, we will conclude a prayer of confession in all Lenten services. After the confession, a group will sing the song from the depth of sin. And while we listen to the song, one candle will be extinguished today and an additional candle each Sunday until Good Friday when we will be left in darkness. Please join me in the confessional prayer followed by a moment of silence. Deep calls to deep. We call to you from the depth of our hearts. We confess that we have stayed too close to the surface, avoiding you, O oh God, avoiding our neighbors. We confess that we have at times felt in over our heads, needing you, needing our neighbors. to deep. You call us from the depth of your love. You call us to deep relationship. The divine calls for us to move beyond the shallows of our lives into the deep relationship. God requires our trust and vulnerability as we reach out to a neighbor, bursting the surface bubbles of our life and striving for deeper understanding. Go into this week before you, reaching out for a story far beyond your own in love. Go in peace. Great. 